Welcome to AgriPulse Newsmakers, where we aim to take you to the heart of ag policy. I'm Spencer Chase. Our guest this week is former House Ag Committee Chair Colin Peterson, who joins us to discuss the Black Sea grain trade deal and the upcoming midterm elections. But first, here's this week's headlines. USDA is distributing more than $223 million to give producers more local options when it's time to process their animals. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack says beef, pork, and mixed processing capacity are expected to increase by about half a million head per year, and poultry processing could increase by 34 million birds per year. All told, the projects are estimated to create about 1,100 long-term jobs, not including the construction jobs required to build or expand funded facilities. A measurement of producer sentiment is down for the second straight month. More than 40% of producers surveyed for the Ag Economy Barometer from Purdue University and the CME Group said their top concern for their farm's financial future performance is high input costs for the next year. 21% said rising interest rates and 13% said lower commodity prices. The numbers are in line with the state of mind in farm country in late 2015 and early 2016 when farm income was about 40% lower than today's figures when adjusted for inflation. And finally, the Russian government says it will continue to allow grain to be shipped out of the Black Sea, but the situation remains volatile. Russia abruptly announced it was suspending its participation in the Black Sea Grain Initiative late last week after claiming its ships were attacked near the corridor used by commercial ships to transport grain. The deal was originally signed in July and has since allowed for greater movement of key goods out of the region. Ukraine has exported nearly 10 million metric tons of corn, wheat, vegetable oil, and other ag commodities since signing the deal. According to data from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, prices of global food staples have dropped in every month of the deal's existence. Colin Peterson was an active observer of agricultural trade during his 30 years in Congress, he says turmoil like the last week for the Black Sea is not conducive to reliable world trade. Well, <laughs> you saw what happened, uh, you know, when the thing got suspended, the prices went up significantly here in the United States. And then when it uh, when it got extended, then the prices went down, you know. So uh, I think my producers up here are looking at this like, you know, this is, you know, if this, this is not a bad deal for us. It's probably not good for the people in Africa and so forth. Uh, but um, I don't hear much talk about it from my farmers. So as as though the that market volatility that you pointed out, obviously big, big swings in the markets as we are, as we and, and really everyone else in the world is trying to figure out what exactly was going to be Russia's approach here. What is the role of the United States in, in this issue? We know Turkey and the UN are, are you know actively negotiating, but is there something on the geopolitical scale for the U.S. to do? Is there something to, to do for producers? What do you think? Well, um, you know, we're tied in with NATO. And so that, you know, in terms of the war that's going on over there, you know, so I think to some extent we're limited. Uh, we've been involved, since I understand it, uh, negotiating kind of on the sidelines to try to make all this stuff happen. Uh, but, you know, I, I wouldn't trust uh, the Russians as far as I could throw them, you know, so we're, uh, we're kind of at their mercy, you know, at this point, whatever they want to do. And, and, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of pressure on them from people because of, of the effect this is having and folks that depend on, you know, wheat and corn from that part of the world, uh, you know, for their sustenance. Um. So I don't know. I think we're doing what we can, uh, but you know, this is the whole uh, problem when you put all of your well, not I mean, when you have a situation where you're depending on other countries, you know, whatever you're doing, whether it's even really frankly for foreign markets, uh, you are to some extent putting yourself in a situation where you can't control it. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, at the end of the day, these guys uh, in this in this foreign grain market are going to, you know, they're going to buy where they are going to get the best price. Uh, they're going to factor in the longevity or, in other words, the ability to continue to get uh, grain. 
but at the end of the day, uh, most of those folks are looking for the best price. So I don't know. I think we're just going to have to ride out this volatility here in the country. I don't think there's anything that uh, Congress is going to do at this point because of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it might factor into the, you know, into the discussion about whether we should have some kind of a permanent disaster program or permanent support program or whatever. But that's that's not going to come until after the election. Well, and I, I want to discuss the election with you, but just quickly before we pivot to that topic, what do you think is the role of the Biden administration here in terms of uh, using this potentially as an opportunity to pursue trade deals uh, in other parts of the world to kind of counter uh, this growing uh, global economic influence that we're seeing from not only Russia, but also China? Yeah, well, it might it might be an opportunity there. But one of the problems is, uh, you know, uh, we have got new people in these positions. Some of them are not confirmed. Uh, I don't know exactly what they're doing, but, um, you know, I think all of the effort right now is just focused on doing what we can to try to un, uh, untangle the current situation, from what I can tell. We'll be right back to discuss the upcoming midterm elections with Minnesota Democrat Colin Peterson right after this. It's not as simple just to wake up one day and go, I want to be a conservation farmer. You're changing how your, your farming practice is done. You're changing your operation. Farm Credit supported John and Kelly Watley as they shifted to more sustainable farming, improving the environment where they farm and live. Learn more at farmcredit.com slash climate. Every morning, American corn farmers roll their sleeves up and start the work of growing a better future, one bushel at a time with America's crop. A better future made possible by their unmatched sustainability practices and the extraordinary benefits and uses of corn throughout the global economy. And the National Corn Growers Association proudly supports and advocates for all they do year in and year out. Welcome back. There's no mistaking Democrats have struggled to hold on to seats in rural parts of the country. Former House Ag Committee Chair Colin Peterson held on to one such district for 30 years during his tenure in Congress, and he says it's going to be a struggle for the current Democratic Party to regain its footing in rural America. You know, the party is not the party that I was part of uh, when I came to Congress. Uh, Hubert Humphrey would just be appalled if he saw the uh, state of the Democratic Party today. Uh, but it's a combination of things. I mean, it's, uh, we became more and more urban, and those urban influences, uh, you know, were the majority in our caucus, and they led the caucus in the wrong direction for rural America. And that was part of why I lost. Uh, you know, I could withstand Pelosi tying me to Pelosi uh, because I had figured out how to work with her. Uh, she was supportive of agriculture and whatever I did. That was okay. But then when they, uh, the election, when they tied me to her, Ilhan Omar and AOC, that was too much. And people saying, what, what are you doing in a party with those people? You know, so uh, that's part of the problem. We got folks in our party that just do not go over in this part of the world. You've got the gun issue, the abortion issue uh, that affect uh, the rural situation. Uh, but I, I think this is the biggest problem politically we have in agriculture, that we don't have any farm Democrats left. Mm -hmm. And uh, you cannot do farm policy and you can't do a farm bill with one party because it's not going to stick. And uh, I don't know what you do about it, but uh, it's a huge problem. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're maybe heading to another situation like we've had the last couple of times where food stamps and nutrition become the dividing line. Uh, and, you know, if the Republicans take over both the House and the Senate, which they might do, they'll probably end up doing something in nutrition that the Democrats don't support. And if that happens, uh, you know, Biden will veto it and uh, there's not enough uh, votes to override the veto. And so I think it's a huge problem. And I, I don't really know what you do to fix it. The Republicans have been smarter. They've put a lot of effort into redistricting 
uh, in that whole process. And so they have gerrymandered these districts. To some extent, that's why we don't have any Democrats left. But it's just um, the, the party, what the party supports is more of an urban agenda. And that does not go over in these rural districts. Well, in, in some of these rural districts, obviously, you're going to have a lot of uh, voters that are actively engaged in production agriculture, a lot of folks uh, from kind of the small town America side of things. I wonder, uh, are, are those folks there for the Democratic Party to get? Obviously, it might take a, a messaging change, as you mentioned. Are those folks there for the Democratic Party to get? Or is, are, is that part of the world just too solidly Republican now? Well, at this point, I think it's too solidly Republican. And I'm not sure that our party is willing to move on some of these issues in order to try to win those back. So I don't think this is something you can message your way out of. You know, the party itself has got to uh, change some of the things that it's doing. And, uh, you know, and the Republicans have been smart to uh, capitalize on some of the stuff that's being said by some of these urban liberals in our party that have given them red meat uh, to go after us on all kinds of different things, whether it be abortion, guns, uh, but transgender bathrooms and uh, CRT and schools and all that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, the so-called woke uh, part of the Democratic Party. And so if you've got people like that shooting off their mouth, <laughs> it it makes it very difficult uh, to, for anybody to survive. I mean, the only uh, Democrats we have left that have any farm district uh, is uh, Angie Craig and uh, Cindy Axney. Uh, you got uh, Sanford Bishop down in in uh, Georgia, but uh, most of the uh, uh, folks that have some production agriculture are surviving because three fourths of their district is urban, you know, is suburban and so forth. So that's how Craig and and uh, Axney actually survive. Uh, Sanford, you know, he's got a rural district. Uh, it's a little different. Uh, uh, he has a large black population, but, you know, I just sent him some money because he's apparently uh, concerned about him surviving. So, uh, you know, the party's got to change. And, mm -hmm. you know, in, in Minnesota, we're probably a good example of this. The legislature now, when I first was elected, uh, I had 34 legislative districts, Senate and House, in my congressional district. 31 of them were Democrat, three were Republican. This was in 1991. Today, uh, as of the last election, there were uh, three Democrats and 31 Republicans. And it looks like after this election, there won't be anybody, maybe one Democrat left in my, whole, in the, my old congressional district, and that's, that's the city of Moorhead which has turned uh, very Republican the last few years. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you do about that. I mean, it's right. uh, very hard to overcome. Well, and you touched on some of the Farm Bill implications of, of, of this, but there there is precedent for getting a farm bill done when the uh, the president is a of a different party than either one or both of the uh, of the majority parties in the House or Senate. But what do you think would be the farm bill implications? You know, if we if we accept the the, the prognostication that Republicans will take the House, let's you know for the sake of argument, say they take the Senate too, they're still going to have to work with the Democratic president to pass a farm bill. What do you think will be the implications there? Well, I think I, I said it earlier. I think. The stumbling block is nutrition. And the way I was able to maneuver this within the Democratic Party was that I worked with uh, Rosa DeLauro and Nancy Pelosi and uh, 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 you know, uh, my colleague from Massachusetts. Uh, and, uh, anyway, <laughs> I worked with them. We came up with a uh, nutrition package that they could support. And once that happened, then I pretty much had free reign to work on the the rest of the farm was the farm bill, the Title One crop insurance, uh, uh, conservation, rural development, and so forth. Uh, I don't see that going on right now, and I I, I think I've been trying preaching to people that uh, if the Republicans take over, they need to go over and figure out from the from the Senate and the House Democrats what it is they can live with on food stamps or what it is they want. 
Uh, Pat Roberts was smart enough in the last farm bill to understand that. He made a deal with Debbie Stavadov before we even started that uh, food stamps were off, off the uh, table. And uh, Conaway did not take part in that, and that caused a divide in the House. At the end of the day, uh, Conaway had to give in, and they ended up where they would have been in the first place. So I just think they just keep chasing this, uh, and I, it's not going to happen. And, mm -hmm. and if they don't understand, if they don't listen, there will not be a farm bill, at least until 2025, and then, you know, depend on who gets elected at that point. Well, and uh, elections certainly coming up uh, this uh, this upcoming Tuesday. We will know a lot more about the upcoming farm bill process once uh, votes are cast uh, in that upcoming midterm election. But for now, we'll have to go with the information we've got. And at this point, uh, we appreciate what you've shared with us here. Uh, former House Ag Committee Chair Colin Peterson, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Enjoyed it. We'll be right back to hear from this week's panel. But first, our Hannah Pagel takes a look at the House races on our radar in the upcoming midterm elections. Democrats have been in control of the House since reclaiming the majority in the 2018 midterm elections. But on Tuesday, voters across the country could tip the balance of power back to the GOP. This chart shows the current makeup on the House of Representatives. Democrats hold a 220 over 212 majority, and three vacancies will be filled in the upcoming elections. It's important to note that in the 2018 midterms, Democrats were able to pick up seats in many districts with rural and suburban voters. Republicans have an opportunity to flip seats in their favor this time to try and regain control. Races for all 435 seats will be important, but we're going to be paying special attention to seven toss-up races with implications for ag policy. Five of those races involve Democratic members of the House Ag Committee. In Connecticut, Democrat Johanna Hayes is facing Republican George Logan. Virginia Democrat Abigail Spamberger is going up against Republican Yesley Vega. New York Democrat Sean Patrick Maloney is currently representing the 18th district, but he's running in the 17th district because both districts were remapped. He's facing Republican Michael Lawler. Minnesota Democrat Angie Craig is facing Republican Tyler Kistner. Finally, Washington Democrat Kim Schreier is facing Republican Matt Larkin. We're also paying attention to two races with Republican incumbents. California Republican David Valadeo is on the House Ag Appropriations Committee. He's currently neck and neck with Democratic challenger Rudy Salas. Meanwhile, Nebraska Republican Don Bacon, who's on the House Ag Committee, is in a close race with Democratic challenger Tony Vargas. For AgriPulse, I'm Hannah Pagel. Agriculture Future of America is a nonprofit building transformational leaders in food and agriculture. AFA prepares college students to join the workforce as innovative and engaged young professionals who will shape the future of agriculture. Head to agfuture.org to find out how you can get involved. Welcome back to AgriPulse Newsmakers, where we're excited to be joined by this week's panel to continue our discussion on the Black Sea Grain Initiative and some of the developments that we've seen on that over the course of the last week. Joined this week by Kip Tom with Tom Farms and Vince Peterson with the U.S. Wheat Associates. Appreciate both of you taking the time. And, and Kip, I want to go to you first because uh, we've seen a bit of a will they or won't they uh, with uh, with Russia in regards to this grain deal. Uh, you know, just how, how do you assess sort of the strength of that deal right now, given all of the uncertainty that we've seen uh, from Russia? Well, I just returned from Ukraine uh, just about a week and a half ago, and I can tell you there is a lot of uncertainty with the deal. Uh, we don't know, you know, for sure how the behaviors of uh, Vladimir Putin is going to behave under different scenarios. And though I think they're very easy for them to find reasons to discontinue the deal, as we saw this last weekend, on again, off again. And so it's uh, I'm just glad we've, we've resumed trade and we're moving it back out in the Black Sea. So, I mean, yes, trade has resumed, but there was still plenty of, you know, political and military uncertainty. At a certain point, does it, does it become a little bit untenable for, for private sector companies uh, to, to be considering uh, this, this particular route? They seem to be pretty aggressive in there. They've moved out about a little over 7 million metric tons to date uh, since the initiative has started. Uh, we know that there's been a backup uh, down in uh, Turkey with uh, nearly 100 and some ships waiting to be uh, 
uh, inspected before they can go on, on out into the world markets. But, uh, you know, in my travels there this past uh, two weeks, uh, I can say this, that uh, we're seeing a lot of movement of grain from the interior markets to the ports uh, to move on out into that global marketplace. But they got a long way to go. You know, they probably still have well over 20 million metric tons of last year's crop to move before they can even harvest much more of this year's crop and put it into storage for uh, movement later this winter or in the next summer. Well, and Vince, as we've discussed here already, a ton of uncertainty, a ton of changes just within the last week on the scope of this deal. But I wonder, as, as someone, you know, U.S. wheat obviously pays such close attention to global wheat markets, not just that uh, of, of the United States. Wondering, how has the last week of uncertainty impacted those global wheat markets? Well, you know, I think we put the burden of this whole thing on, on squarely on Putin's shoulders. Frankly, if you uh, if we didn't have a war in Ukraine, we didn't have a blockade of the port of Odessa in the first place and the attack of merchant marine shipping, uh, fostering all this stuff, we wouldn't be talking about this stuff. So I think it's important to remember where this the blame for this comes. But in terms of uh, effect on the world trade, we're getting, of course, price volatility. Every time Putin decides he's in or he's out or he's in or he's out, we're getting we're getting corresponding spikes and, and troughs in the, in the wheat market as we try to figure out what, what direction we're going with that. But I would happen to agree with Tom on the assessment that it, uh, when, the, when the smoke clears, commodities have been moving out of there. And you try to assess a little bit what hole is left in the marketplace by the war over there. And frankly, uh, in, in, in my opinion on this, it's not really a very big hole in the wheat market as long as we keep moving at the pace we're doing. Last year, Russia and Ukraine, I think, exported about 52 million tons of wheat, that's a million wheat and feed wheat together from the two places. And even this year, with the war going on, we're anticipating even more wheat coming out of the Black Sea than, than last year. And that's with about half of the volume of Ukraine, but much more wheat potentially coming out of Russia, unless the whole thing collapses completely. But they've got a huge crop. Uh, so in the end, I think we're in a pretty good balance, but we just have the uncertainty overweighing everything. Well, and if we, I know it's really hard to, to ask you to do something like this, but if we take the, the Black Sea issues kind of out of the equation and look at the rest of the world wheat market, what are things looking like around the world elsewhere? Yeah, you know, actually we started the year with kind of a, a little bit of a tight situation where we're consuming more wheat in the world than we we're producing right off the bat this year. But, but since things have progressed, we have a record crop in Russia that's, that's over looming. They had a big crop last year and a big one this year. Uh, so there's a lot of wheat backed up, and it's going to be backed up over there. But then we've had some recent things turning against us, just the world, just a little bit since that time. You have this La Nina effect, which is which is real and which is true, and it's affecting the wheat production in Australia. They're looking to have a, a, a not quite but near record crop, but about a quarter of that crop right now, maybe 8 million tons, is going to be downgraded because of the torrential rains in the eastern part of Australia. Conversely, in Argentina, a torrential drought has been affecting the country. They're cutting exports back. They're probably going to be down five or six million tons in total wheat exports out of Argentina this year. So you got kind of things going two different directions. So the things that we look at, we, we compete with Argentina in our hemisphere. We compete with Australia in the Pacific. Our, our environment, our market environment, what we're logistically close to is actually in a different circumstance, perhaps than maybe Africa, uh, South Asia, and some others that are more tributary to Russia. We'll be right back to continue our discussion on the war in Ukraine and the global wheat markets right after this. Did you know AgriPulse has all your favorite podcasts, including Open Mic, Newsmakers, and Drive Time. Take us wherever you go. Subscribe at agripulse.com or on Spotify, Google Play, or Apple Podcasts. Welcome back. As the global wheat trade seeks to react to whether or not Russia will in fact remain in the Black Sea Grain Initiative, Vince Peterson with the U.S. Wheat Associate says U.S. producers are facing multifaceted impacts. Yeah, I think it's, it's given us a couple of things. One, it has admittedly given us a higher price structure uh, in the whole thing, whether that's energy focused war focused, uh, input focused, all of those kind of things are leading to higher prices. Uh, I, I, some this year are doing quite well under that structure. Uh, we've had some good areas, with some good yields, but then you take the big hard red winter wheat area, which was stricken by drought and the yields were very modest. When you put the high prices of uh, fertilizers and inputs on top of a low yield, yeah, that's a pretty big stress for a lot of those producers. So it's a little bit of a mixed message on if we're coming out better or worse on this thing. But I think prices are such 
it probably is a little bit of an incentive to, to increase some wheat production a little bit this year. Well, and on that front, I know obviously winter wheat is so incredibly important to American wheat production. Do you think the, the current picture around uh, the world is going to have any measure of impact on spring wheat uh, acres uh, in the U.S.? Oh, I can't imagine that, that, it, that it won't. We've got a little bit of time to, to, to think about that before we get to next March or, uh, March or April. Um, I, I wouldn't begin to guess which, which way that's going to go. I think it's going to depend on, uh, on competitive prices of soybeans, oil seeds, corn, all of those things, sugar beets, all of those things that impact spring wheat producers' uh, planting matrix when they come to that time period. I think I'd defer a little bit on that question. Well, and, and obviously when we look at the, the Black Sea Grain Initiative, global wheat production, obviously you, you can't separate this issue from the hunger issue around the world. And, and Kip, you and I have spoken about this issue before, and we look at figures from, from the UN, from the Food and Agriculture Organization, we see some trending downward as, as folks are looking to um, you know, uh, better understand that grain initiative. Have things trended downward enough to make any kind of a uh, significant dent in global hunger? Well, unfortunately, no, we haven't made the, the strides we need to there. We know that uh, it's not only just access to the physical commodities itself, it's access to the capital to buy uh, those physical commodities. But if I could go back for a little bit here and address the, the wheat production issues, we look into Ukraine and uh, you know, I met with a number of the large associations when I was there. And typically they seed somewhere around seven to seven and a half million hectares of winter wheat. Uh, I know some of the report numbers that came out of the USDA and WASDA and others here recently indicated they planted nearly three and a half to four uh, million hectares of, of winter wheat. The people we were talking to said so they seeded about two and a half million hectares. So they've got that issue going on. They have lack of capital to uh, buy the fertilizer, to fertilize that wheat. They don't have access to fertilizer at this point in time for this coming winter season to apply the nitrogen to the wheat, wheat crops. So uh, we've got a lot of issues in front of us about the physical commodity itself and the money to buy that product to go out there and make those, uh, the impact on global hunger. Kip, I know in, in some of your previous travels over there, you've spoken with folks that have had uh, issues getting access to diesel. Obviously, uh, diesel a very important fuel from a military operational standpoint. What is that looking like for the, the Ukrainian producer? What Will they have the supplies available to do what they need? It's very difficult. You know, we talked to a number of the top 10 producers in the country, and uh, a lot of them are having issues with access to electricity. We know that Putin's been very strategic in his bombing of infrastructure throughout the country. So a lot of them are running very large grain facilities uh, with generators at a minimum capacity. Uh, we know that the farmers don't have money to dry grain, so they're, they're bringing in grain in, letting it stay in the field as long as you can. One producer we met had nearly a quarter million acres of corn to harvest and hasn't harvested a single acre yet because uh, he can't access the diesel fuel to put in the combines to run the trucks to get the crop in his storage and let alone he has his storage is almost full. And, you know, that's why they're watching the Black Sea initiative to see if it goes forward or not, because they're in a position, they can't move the product out of their bins. They don't have room for harvest. So they're in a very difficult situation, not only in fuel, but fertilizer, crop care products, most importantly, capital is the biggest issue. What, what role do you think fertilizer is playing here in, in sort of the, the health of this Black Sea Grain Initiative? Because I have to imagine Russia is very interested in getting its fertilizer to global markets. And, and this deal is a, is a big part of that, Kip. I couldn't agree more. I, I speak, I've speak spoken to Amir Mohammed, uh, who's uh, representing the UN on the Black Sea Initiative, and uh, it is an important component of this whole trade deal as Russia continue to see their fertilizer flow into the global markets, and not at the discount that was earlier. They want to see it and get world prices for it. Uh, I really struggle with that because uh, I know very well that the money we're spending on nitrogen in the United States and other places is doing nothing but funding Putin's war against the Ukrainians. So it's uh, it's a very difficult situation. So a lot of developments that we've seen over the course of the past week with this Black Sea Grain Initiative. I can't imagine that we've seen the end uh, of developments on that uh, in, in the near term or certainly in the long term as we look to see what is the future of that deal currently set to expire on the 19th of November. But Kip and Vince, we appreciate the time. We're glad to be Thank with you, you Spencer. We'll be right back with more AgriPulse Newsmakers. But first, our Hannah Pegel takes a look at the Senate races we'll be watching in Tuesday's midterm elections. Republicans are seeking to gain a majority in the Senate in the midterm elections. And the current 50-50 Senate means only one seat needs to flip their way for that to happen. But a good night for Democrats could grow the narrow majority they have when Kamala Harris casts a tie-breaking vote. 
This map shows the Senate races taking place in 2022, when one third of the chamber is up for re-election. You can see many incumbents are expected to hold onto their seats, but we're going to be paying attention to four races, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Iowa. The race in Georgia is one of the most hotly contested seats in this election. Incumbent Democratic Senate Ag Committee member Raphael Warnock is facing off against Republican challenger Herschel Walker. The race is a toss-up and may end up going to a runoff. Another race in the national spotlight is in Pennsylvania, where Democrat John Fetterman is running against Republican Mehmet Oz. Fetterman had a healthy lead in polls earlier this year, but this race is now considered a toss-up. In Iowa, Republican incumbent Chuck Grassley is facing off against Democratic challenger Mike Franken. Grassley is seeking his eighth consecutive term, and polls give him a slight advantage. In Wisconsin, incumbent Republican Ron Johnson is facing off against Democrat Mandela Barnes. Right now, most polls give Johnson the advantage. Colorado, New Hampshire, North Carolina, Nevada, and Ohio could offer other close races to watch on election night. For AgriPulse, I'm Hannah Pagel. Farmers are always there for each other. We shed tears together, we celebrate together, but we also grow together. Farm Bureau is the largest general farm organization in the country. We have the farmers back. If you're a farmer and you're not a member, we would welcome you into our Farm Bureau family. And if you wanna know more about agriculture, Come be part of this great family. Looking closer, seeing further. That's how we do it. At Curious Plot, we're driven to find what's next for agriculture, animal care, and food. We stay curious because that's what it takes to grow understanding. That's how we plot strategies and tell stories that get results time after time. Marketing, communications, and consulting that look closer and see further. Curious Plot. We can't wait to help you tell your story. Thanks again for tuning in for another episode of AgriPulse Newsmakers. Before we let you go, here's what's on the horizon for the upcoming week. Tuesday's elections will, of course, be the big story of the week. We'll have coverage of what we know in Wednesday's newsletter, and check back with us Wednesday afternoon for a webinar on the results. USDA will release selected tables, including 10-year projections for major U.S. crops and livestock products. And finally, the latest version of the Consumer Price Index will be rolled out on Thursday. As always, stay tuned to AgriPulse.com for all of this and more. For AgriPulse Newsmakers, I'm Spencer Chase. Have a good one. Newsmakers is a production of AgriPulse Communications. For more ag policy news, visit agripulse.com. You can also find our new content on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. Don't forget to follow Agripulse and our correspondents on social media to get breaking news and more.